I'm here at the Deputy Head Office in Surrey Hills in Sydney and I'm delighted to have with me the CEO, the CTO and the co-founder of Deputy. Welcome, Ashit. Thank you, Jared. Thank you for having me. That's a pleasure. So I thought what I'd do just to start with is just give the listeners a little bit of a background as to what we're going to do today. So what we're actually here to do today is to ask Ashit three questions. And the first question is going to be on the future of workforce management. The second question will be on what does that mean for people and customers? And then the final question will be what does that mean from a board and a shareholder perspective? And before we get going today though, Ashik, I thought it might be a great way to start just by asking you how did you get into the world of workforce management? Uh, I'd be lying to say that that's what I had talked when I first heard and they said, what do you want to be when you grow up, that, uh, you know, grade two or something like that, but no, that's not how it started. <laughs> Look, I mean, as, uh, as Chan said it, I, uh, when I came out of uh, university, um, through a common friend, I was introduced to my current co-founder, Steve Shelley, and he was running um, an aviation ground handling business, and it's a very intensive business. By intensive, what I mean is that it's 24 hours is uh, very unionized, it's uh, kind of very compliant. You know, in aviation, uh, there's no room for error because you're yes. playing with people's life. And running a workforce in there was extremely, extremely painful, especially a distributed workforce yes. as well. Like, you know, my, uh, Steve's business was here in Sydney, in, in Melbourne, in Newcastle, all the way up in Cairns. And um, it was really hard to grow a business. I mean, by hard, I mean it took about 10 years to grow the business uh, from two people to 200 people between 92 and, and 2002. And, uh, and after I met Steve, uh, I, I observed all these inefficiencies mm. in the business, mm. even, even down to things like what happens when somebody calls in sick. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and by observing all the challenges, we were able to build some internal systems which then allowed to really scale the business. To, by scale, I mean that over the next three years, we were able to grow the business from 200 to nearly 1,400 people. Right. Um, and uh, obviously, significant improvement in revenue and profitability. And uh, and you know, I, I did not do an MBA or something like yeah, that. Yeah. But uh, I'm actually just um, a bachelor of computer science, and I realized that hey, people is the number one most important thing in the business. Mm. Okay, mm. I mean. Whatever, I mean, and if you talk to anyone, uh, people won't say that, hey, my suppliers are my keeping up my, my customers are keeping me up at night. People will say that their people are keeping them up at night. And for Steve, that was just a reality, yeah. um, a reality that he had accepted that it can't be improved. Mm. But, mm. Uh, uh, you know, we were able to make an improvement, a massive improvement. And I suppose that's how I found myself in the world of workforce management. And now, uh, you know, uh, through the journey to success, we actually then found a deputy, and today um, nearly 80,000 businesses around the world that are enjoying the same level of success. Amazing story, and uh, I think one of the things sort of for me that sort of stands out there in what you were saying is that even though you had that formal university background, most of your real knowledge came from the School of Hard Knocks. It just came from what you learnt in a business that was growing where you needed to make people effectively more efficient and, and more effective. Yeah, absolutely. Look, I mean, I, 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 I learned it the hard way. I, I mean, uh, what I mean by learning the hard way is that, like, and I will go spend time with, uh, you know, um, employees, and they will complain, oh, finished working 2 p.m. 2 last night, had to come in 5 a.m. Mm -hmm. again, um, really, really tired, or, oh, manager, always worrying that, oh, my God, I have got no visibility in there. I've seen things like, you know, uh, people working, people putting in timesheets that where they're working 14 hour days every day of the week for yes. us. Uh, yeah. uh, in, um, and uh, it's just inefficiencies mm. all mm. over. It's yeah. just inefficiencies yeah. all over. And this is 2003, even before the world of cloud computing, mobile, or anything like that. Okay? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and you know the sad story? Those problems are still with many businesses. <laughs> I, I tell you what, I mean, I, I, on Saturday night I was at a family dinner and I was, uh, I was meeting someone, um, actually a family friend's uh, a father, and I was inviting him for dinner and saying that, hey, would you like to, like, I'm, I'm having a dinner party on the 2nd of June, would you like to come over? Yes. It's like, 
Let me check my roster. So he goes to his wallet, pulls out, and there in a leaf of paper, like you know, he has all these ships and things. <laughs> Can I work? I don't know who else is working. I'll have to come back to you. I'm like, yeah, yeah. oh my God, this is 2018. <laughs> and you're there with your cloud technology ready and to go. And my phone, and I'm like, yeah. I'm pulling out my phone, like, you know, you could just go and do this you know, yeah. if you had yeah. deputy, but anyway. Yeah. So there's, there's, there's a lot of work to be done. A yeah, lot so that, to be done. So that's probably a really good segue uh, into, into the sort of the first question of today. Um, where do you see the world of workforce management heading? You know, here we are today in 2018 and we're, we're at a point in, in evolution. Where, where do we go from here? Where does, where does the workforce go from here? Look, there's two parts to it, okay? Um, uh, part number one is, you know, uh, fixing what's broken, okay? Uh, and, and what I mean by what's broken is, you know, what people have accepted for um, all along is that, hey, this is like how life is, yeah, okay? Yeah. And, uh, you know, I mean, you turn on, uh, turn on the news, there's just so much complaint about people not being paid correctly. There was something mm -hmm. on the news this weekend about somebody who wasn't, you know, paying tips to their employee correctly, right, right. all sorts of different things. There was a massive article on, um, on Wall Street Journal over the weekend where uh, some of the major airlines in the United States hasn't been, uh, you know, tracking people's break correctly yeah, and yeah. currently there is a class action that is happening in there. It's just that so many things that are broken mm. right now, mm. okay? Mm. I mean, even to the fact that, um, uh, I mean, one of our closest customer here in Deputy Mothership is uh, this uh, cafe called Cuckoo College, it's just across the road. Uh, great coffee, everyone should visit there as well as, I'd like to, uh, and gelato as well, I'd like to, uh, you know, from what our customers were, yeah, I can, yeah, yeah. including Chi too. So thank you, Jared, for you know, helping that. But you know, even on those businesses, when you go and um, you know uh, employ someone, uh, like you know, the Fair Work Award of paying somebody accurately, the high that uh, you know, mm -hmm. hospital industry and gaming award, it's 104 pages. Yes. And you know, the funny thing, you might get your rental contract, like you know, your rent uh, a rental agreement or any other agreement. It might be 100 pages, but you probably need to focus only two or three pages, okay? Yes. And probably the exit clause, okay? Mm -hmm. That's about it. In any agreement you need to look into. Yeah. But the funny thing about the Fair Work Award is that you probably need to know 100 of the 104 pages, mm -hmm. okay? And that's just the level of complexity that exists today yes. where things are broken. Um, but on the, on the flip side of it, it's actually, um, you know, we need to be fair to the employee as well. I mean, employee needs to be uh, remunerated for the work they do. Yes. But people, like, you know, nobody walks around. The manager doesn't walk around with 104 pages in their head to know mm. that exactly mm. how the employee mm. should be paid. Correct. These are things that are broken, okay? That needs to be fixed, that can be automated, and deputy exists to do that. Yeah. On this other side of improvement is where the world is heading. Where the world is heading, um, I mean, in media, it's labeled as a gig economy. I don't actually think of it as gig economy. I think, I think of it as what I like to call this instant gratification economy. Right, right. Where whatever you want, whenever you want, wherever you want, you will get it. Mm -hmm. I want to watch something, I can watch it anywhere yes. in Netflix. I want to yeah. eat something, I can Uber it or deliver it yeah. wherever, I, yeah. uh, wherever I want. And that's where the world of work will be heading because that's how we're just getting trained. That's how our brain, mm. brain is getting trained. The mm. fact that there will be, the fact that we have to conform to any kind of schedule or roster to do work, employees or people or those who are coming into workforce are not just going to accept that. Okay, they mm. will, mm. they will go where where they can like kind of get freedom and flexibility. Mm. And the flip side of it is also true. So if I'm a business now, okay, I have my customers that I have to service. If my customer service and customer experience is not tailored yes. to that need, I will not survive. Mm, mm. I will not survive. That's why if you think about Amazon, it's just going up and up and up and up and up. And there's all these um, you know, retailers who are kind of either kind of being stagnant or going down mm, in mm. there. And so to meet that customer demand, you also need to meet the... Um, you know, your, your workforce needs in terms yes. of how you're scheduling yeah. your people. I mean, your people, your employees are the ones who are facing the customer, not you. Mm -hmm. It's not the uh, you know, board, mem uh, board members or, or CEO who's, who is facing Correct. that. Correct. And how do you ensure that they're, they're, they're the best people 
Mm. But they're in there, like they have been trained. They are actually happy to come to work in there. It's actually a, it's actually a massive analytical trade-off job. Yeah, so I think, yeah. like you know, that's where there will be just so much innovation that will happen. Mm. So mm. much innovation that will happen, and uh, um, and I think, like you know, through deputy, we'll be able to make a significant difference. We are already doing that. We have made uh, some massive changes to many customers life through the technology we have yeah. in yeah. there but you know and independent of deputy that's that's where the world is heading so if you if you're not thinking like that mm. you're going to be left behind and once you live, are left behind you will be disrupted yeah indeed and i think i think that's really a good way that you look at it it's very pragmatic so the first part is really around compliance making sure that what we are supposed to be doing we yep. are actually doing and then the second part is really around a an optimization or a working more effect effectively with with the way in which the world is heading at, at this point in time. Absolutely. Look, I mean, the, the theory of disruption is that to disrupt an incumbent, you have to do this cheaper and better. Mm. Okay. You can't just do better. You can't just do cheaper. You have to do do it cheaper and better. And when you do cheaper and better, you can displace um, anyone. And I think, like, you know, there's quite a lot of people. Who will be disrupting, um, you know, how service is provided, and will be disrupting many industries. A absolutely, and I, I think I've sort of noticed that myself. Like we very much live in a service economy now. Like, sure, we need the technology to support the service economy, but but the world is very much driving down a, a service route. That's, absolutely, that's where we're, where absolutely. We're heading. So, so, so moving on to sort of the next question now. So, what does that mean? in practical terms from an employee perspective? Where, where how, how does that unfold from an employee? Look, uh, two parts in there as well, one second. I mean, okay, let me, let me break it down this way, that if you look at the working population, okay, if you look at the working population, there is a, um, you know, 60% of the working population is hourly paid. What I mean by hourly paid is that they get paid for the hours they work. It yes. might be full time, yeah. but still you get paid for the hours you work. Mm. And there's those who are uh, like on a salary paid. Yeah. Okay. Like you know, it doesn't matter whether you work forty hours or yeah. fifty hours yeah. or uh, or hundred hours, you're mm. still paid mm. uh, the same amount. Um, uh, like me, for example. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> um, a, and and but, but the thing, like you know, what's happening over here is that. Um, but by the way, on, even on that side, there, there's some quite a lot of regulations coming. Like, in you know, France recently passed a law that you can't email somebody after working hours, for example. Right. right. Okay. Uh, there's quite a lot of changes happening in, in, in yeah, both sides. Yeah. But, but the sixty percent of the uh, working population is hourly paid. Okay. And and if you look at the psychology of an hourly pay, uh, you know, paid employee. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, first of all, uh, the average tenure of somebody working in a place when they're hourly employee is only nine months. Every nine months, mm. they're going mm. and from one job to another job in there. Okay. Yeah. That's not necessarily that. That's nowhere near being true or anything like that mm. for the mm. you know the salary worker, where you know they're probably uh, depending on what part of the world you are in, they're probably you know anywhere between twelve months to um, you know four years, and yes. and depending on like you know um, uh, how the how that industry is working mm. and what mm. the what are the uh, working conditions. Now, if you if you put yourself, and I'm only going to talk about the hourly one because that's yeah. my special yeah, thing, sure. and that's what we, we study uh, all the time, is that if you are going and changing job every nine months, okay, how are you doing that? Mm, mm. And imagine if you're an employer on the other side, oh my god, every nine months the whole workforce I have has changed. Yeah, okay? yeah. How do you go tackle that problem mm. in there? Okay, I mean, and you will find that, hey, um, you know, you're constantly looking for new um, a job opportunity as, a, as an employee in there. Um, and if you're a manager, you're constantly hiring yeah. um, as well. And like, uh, there is not, no such thing as a, uh, a LinkedIn for a, say, hourly paid worker. Mm -hmm. okay? and, and that's obviously a, a, you know, that's another completely new topic that we can probably spend another yeah. a whole day talking about. But uh, from a, a employee perspective, I think, you know, the, the and if you are going to uh, change your job every nine nine months in there, okay. Here's the thing: you need to be finding work really, really quickly and easily, okay. So they will adopt the technologies that they can use to get work really, really quickly. Mm -hmm. Number one. 
Number two, on the other side of it, from a manager perspective, they need to be sourcing candidates really quickly, as in qualified candidates very quickly, yes, really, yes. because you don't want to get all your time, you know, um, uh, crunched into just recruitment all the time. Correct. And then when the employee comes over, look into how soon and easily you can onboard those people. Mm, mm. Okay. And once you're onboarded, how soon they're effective in the business as mm. well that you need to uh, uh, look into um, in there. And then from the manager side over there, you know, how, how soon can I get them up to productivity mm. in there? So it's not like in you know, a two or three months of training and then they're into productivity. You probably need to hit the productivity really, really quickly and, and very soon. In yeah. There. yeah. So it's a, and, and depending on the kind of industry you are in, okay, uh, it can be really, really hard. I recently heard a stat in the United States that the, it takes about 18 months to find a nurse for a aged care service and um, apparently the average tenure is 12 months, so mm -hmm. <laughs> figure that in terms yeah. of how, 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 how complex it becomes um, uh, in there. So I think um, what it means for employees is that you know what they are just going to continuously seek more freedom and more flexibility through every aspect of their work journey. In their yeah, work. and I think that's actually a, a really interesting thing to consider as we look at the other side of the equation in terms of well, what does it actually mean to a customer because if you've got a workforce that's changing over regularly then how do you ensure that your customers are getting that great customer satisfaction that great personalization of service how does that gap get bridged from from a workforce management and from a from an employer's point of view? Look, uh, I believe that, first of all, it differs from, uh, you know, vertical to vertical. Yes. Yeah, okay. I mean, what it might be for a hospitality, hospitality kind of business mm. might be completely different into, um, you know, say, a healthcare business, um, or retail for that matter, yeah. as yeah. well, okay, where you need to maintain a, a deep customer relationship for quite some time. Mm. Mm. Okay, um, to get uh, meaning out of meaning out of that service, but from an employer perspective and um, you know from a customer perspective as well. Like, okay, let me just go back to the absolute root of it, and this is what I have observed with yeah, many, many, yeah. Uh, many, 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 many customers. A founder goes to start a business because they're, you know, they're good at something, mm. or they have an idea that they think they can execute. Okay. They started on their own, then very soon they realized that they can't do anything, everything on their own. So they go hire somebody, okay? Um, and, you know, the first few hires are really easy because they have, they get that founder magic, okay? Yeah, yeah. Of, a, of a business. And, you know, what they can truly instill, hey, and I'm once again going to use a hospitality example, this is how you make a coffee, okay? Yeah, this is yeah. how you smile to customer, mm, okay? Mm. But as the business hits success in there, okay, and they scale up, you you hire managers and who become managers, actually you don't hire managers most often, you probably will promote somebody in the business as a manager. Yeah. And who do you promote as a manager? Your best employee. Indeed. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. this is where the you know, fundamental problem I see mm. 101 is that uh, given that the best employee has become a manager and all of a sudden this manager has to do all these admin things, including that hiring bit I was talking mm. about every mm. nine months, um, uh, like you know, what you have literally done is taken your best performer out of the front line and they stuck them with a job in a corner office mm. that they probably will not be enjoying that much. Yeah, yeah. And so everything suffers. So that, that's the funny thing. Like, you know, business start, they scale really high, and somehow they reach this uh, cruising altitude where they're just tangled with all these problems where they can't go higher anymore. And then over time, you know, most businesses actually die of what I like to call indigestion, not necessarily starvation. No mm. business actually mm. has ended up over here because they could not, you know, get enough customers. Yeah. They actually yeah. has mangled up their processes in there and kind of absorbed all this thing that through indigestion they have, they have died in there. So um, I would say that like, to avoid these sort of things and with the, with the um, change in work practices and employee desire of flexibility and freedom, you really need to get systems on very, very early. Mm, mm, okay? Some mm. businesses leave it really, really late. And when they come to do it really late, in there, what happens is that you have your culture or other things that are ingrained that this yeah. is how people are doing it. It's really hard to go and you know manage that change, uh, like the culture changing there of how things uh, how things are going to change. So from a from a business owner perspective, looking into the future, um, I would say that you really want to put the customer need first, mm. 
and you also want to put the employee need in there. And there is a cross section where they both can be satisfied in there. Yeah, that should be the goal. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Very, very, very tight crossover. I think it's getting tighter and tighter. Absolutely. So, so there you go. You need to avoid indigestion. Exactly. And, uh, <laughs> get the get the right processes in place to start with. Absolutely. So I, I think that's some good advice. So on to my final question today. With the customer, the employee, the technology in mind, as a as a as an owner of a business, as a board of directors, or as a shareholder to make sure that the business is future-proofed to, to move forward, what, what should the owners and the shareholders of businesses be thinking and doing right now to make sure that they're ready to, to stay current and to avoid that indigestion? There's many ways I can answer this question. Look, I mean, one of the best advice I ever received um, and it was given to me by George Roberts of OpenView when, when actually after we did the fundraising, yeah. uh, after we saw the term that night, uh, we, we went out to dinner and I remember George Roberts saying this to me, Shit, every day you're gonna have to go make decisions. Mm -hmm. If you follow this framework, you will never make the wrong decision. I'm like, mm -hmm. what's, the, what's the framework? It's like company, customer, employee, partner, okay? Make your decision in that order. What's the best decision for the company? What's the best decision for the customer? What's the best decision for the employee? And what's the best decision for a partner? In yeah. that, in that yeah. order. It's controversial. Mm. It's controversial. Mm. And I mean, usually you should be able to make decisions that ticks across all those things mm. in there. But if you ever come into a, um, a crossroad where you're finding yourself that it's, it's a cross at the top, but a tick at the bottom uh, in that order, you most likely will end up making, uh, making an uh, incorrect decision yeah. in there. Yeah. Uh, or a decision of being right, and from a, to apply that framework. And by the way, not it's 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 a, it's applicable to a business which is at growth stage, yeah. more so than a a business which is at peace stage. Mm. What I mean by being at peace is like um, so the four banks of Australia, they they have all carved out their territories and they're just happy. There's a competition for them is a big ship in the ocean that doesn't bother them. Yeah, okay? yeah. Whereas in many other industries, okay, um, where they're really, really fighting and fighting hard to, to win market share. Mm. When, and there are cases that, like, you know, it's, a, it's a case of winner take all, yeah, for example. Yeah. Um, in there, this sort of you know, decision making is really, really important. Mm. Now, depending on where you are as a business, okay, mm. are you attacking growth or are you at peace? Mm. Okay? Mm. Um, you need to look at it in, in, in different ways. And, from a uh, shareholder perspective, or, or from a business owner perspective, the way I like to um, advise is that really, really putting the customer first. Okay, I mean uh, the CEO they say has one, well, multiple bosses being the board of directors in yeah, there, yeah. but actually the CEO has hundreds of thousands of bosses. Mm. This is the customer. Mm, mm. Okay, and the customer uh, can just fire and change their mind. Like that, indeed they can, and and then that what will happen is that like you know, the business will just completely, uh, you know, die, and all the hard work that has been put by everybody in building the business, mm. including the employees, mm. will will, you know, be nothing. Mm. Okay, at, at the end of it. So, uh, it, and like you know, I mean, you only need to go and read that um, you know, shareholder letter that Jeff Bezos wrote. Mm. Okay, is is day one. Um, um, I think it's their one letter uh, in there that you know he, he really really highlights highlights this. So from a from a shareholder perspective, when it comes to workforce management, okay, it's about workforce. Man how do you, you utilize your workforce management to provide the best customer service? You need to you need to look at it that way. And the, then the, then the next thing comes over there is that most businesses spend about fifty to sixty percent, in some cases even more, for every dollar they earn mm. on 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 labor, yeah, okay. yeah. How do you go optimize that mm. to build actually even better market share in there, a bigger market share in there? So, mm. it, as I said, it's that it's that fine cross section of meeting my customer demand at the same time looking after the best thing for the employees, which is actually what we released as a feature a couple of weeks ago, yeah, yeah. which was our deputy order scheduling feature, where you mm. can actually build uh, like you know, plug in a lot of demand metrics from your business. And then deputy automatically build your schedule, looking after fairness, looking after the low cost, looking after ensuring that um, you know all the workplace compliance and regulations and 
uh, tribal knowledge that exists in there yeah. is automatically handled. So mm -hmm. as opposed to a manager doing that in their head, you can yeah. press one button in deputy yeah. and deputy does it for you. No, I think I think that's a great answer because it, it's it's far more than monetary value these days. Like yes, we all need to exist and we all need to make money to satisfy everyone. But I think that's some great advice that you received. You know, it's it's about the it's about the customer, it's about the employee, it's about the business, and it's about the partner network that's around you. So it's a, it's a multi-dimensional decision. I mean, I'm a, a, if if you follow me on Twitter, you'll see that I'm quite often. Uh, tweeting about Formula One and other things. I'm an uh, avid, uh, avid follower in there. And I remember reading this um, uh, interview for Barney Eshelton. He was the former um, CEO of Formula One and known to be really, really money hungry and other yeah, things. And yeah. He had this great quote, is that money should never be the focus. Mm. Mm. Money is output of great work you do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's usually money looks after itself if you get those other things right. And for businesses today, as I said, I can put the customer first. If you put the customer first in there mm -hmm. and uh, augment your workforce strategy to meet that customer demand, revenue, profitability, growth, all these things will look after itself. Fantastic. So that's it for me today, Ashik. Um, would you like to add anything else to conclude the interview? Or uh, Look, I mean, a, uh, for many people, especially um, the, the white collar worker community or people who are in board of directors, they actually um, uh, probably don't understand the complexities that are involved in, in workforce management. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, even like you know, paying people the right way, yeah. as I said, yeah. like you know, it's 2018, and to see that there are businesses that are getting caught up all the time and uh, uh, because they're not paying the right wages in there. Uh, I think we need to do more work. And, and Jared, uh, mm -hmm. thank you for doing all the work you do because you're raising awareness of things that can be uh, done better, as well as need to be done in there. So uh, I think we have a, I think we have a lot of lot of work ahead. I mean, obviously, as you asked, what's uh, you know what's the present, what's the future? Um, uh, I mean, from a future perspective, I I recently look, uh, wrote an article on Forbes about what does blockchain mean, for yeah, example, yeah. okay, for um, a, a, for HR. Um, I think I think we're we're just getting started, mm. to be honest, mm. uh, um, and. Uh, um, I'm excited to wake up every morning and um, you know be in this mission to improve the lives of ship workers and and and, and like, you know, to have awesome partners like you is also really really um, you know even more validating. No, oh, that's great, and I think together it's it's a matter of everyone working together from a from a whole community point of view to to improve everyone's lives. At the end exactly, of the day. and the, so and the world will be a better place. Indeed, what we are doing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ashik. No problem. Awesome. Good have a great day. Thank you.